Welcome to the Atlantic Indie Roundabout here at CIOE 97.5 FM. I'm your host, Maurice O'Coyne, and we are streaming live to the world at www.communityradio.ca. We are going to discuss and celebrate independent artists' music from all over the Atlantic region and beyond. Let's all get on the Atlantic Indie Roundabout right now. even care if you do What is it baby what's on your mind Are you still afraid to cry Your laughing words have dwindled one by one And on your door a sign that says to go away Oh come on baby what's on your mind Still afraid to fly. Oh, come on, baby, what's on your mind? Are you still afraid to cry? Once your voice was cool like the wind. Nothing I could say would bring it back again Once you were willing to love all the time Not afraid to try But you don't even care if you do Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very, very special episode of the Atlantic Indie Roundabout. I'm going to try and contact Ken Tobias. I have his number here. And, well, so far, so good. Hello. Good evening. Uh, would this be Ken? Yes, it is. Well, how about that? This is Maurice. Hey, Maurice, how you doing? Very, very well. And before we start, I'd just like to say uh, we're thrilled and honored to have you on our show on the Atlantic Indie Roundabout this week, and it's very nice of you to give up a few minutes of your time. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks very much. appreciate you asking me. So I'd like to start off our conversation, Ken. Uh, I take it you're you, you, you artistically inclined all your whole life? Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been on stage since I've been four years old. I tap dance when I was a kid. I did shows and stuff like this, and uh, I was always had that artistic thing. I always told my mother, she uh, was pretty good in listening to me when I was young. I said, I have a destiny. And uh, she kind of got it, and then she encouraged me in, in the music. As far as the art is concerned, I was um, drawing a little bit when I was when I was young, let's say uh, eight, seven, eight years old. And my father had Boy Scout troop, and he brought them over to the house one day, and I remember one of the guys uh, was an artist, but he had drawn his own comic book. You know, when you do comics these days, like you have to do a blow up for a page. You do them large and then they blow them down. Uh, that's kind of how they do them. And, uh, he had drawn the whole book, uh, at the size of a comic book. Every page, all the various squares, all the various uh, things. And everything within those squares was perfect. Like he could draw a little people looking beautiful i i remember getting up on the table climbing right up and looking at it and being really overwhelmed by his ability and uh and the art and uh you know i've been hooked ever since you know 
did he actually become famous in doing that? It sounds like quite a... Don't even know his... Don't even remember his name. I don't know who he was. I was just a kid, a little kid, and he was one of the Boy Scouts. And that's something? And he could draw. Wouldn't yeah. that be neat to find out if he actually did become something from that? Because that's quite a talent. Well, I can actually remember looking at the thing right, right in my mind right now. And, um, you know, I mean, I studied drafting as well when I got into high school. Yes, I noticed that. You became a draftsman, apparently, for a while. Yeah, well, I... I when I was in high school, we started high school. They, you know, they ask you what do you want to do, and I, uh, I wanted to go to art school. Over across town here in St. John, uh, there's a place called Vocational School, which is where several of the really um, um, fine New Brunswick artists who are now legends of were teaching. And I wanted to go there and just do art. And um, but because it was a different parish, and we were not a wealthy family. My, my parents would have to pay something like a hundred bucks a month to take me across to another parish. So I just resigned myself to take the drafting course at, uh, at Simons Regional High School, even though it was mechanical drafting, not really what I wanted to do, drawing gears and stuff. It was precise and beautifully, you know, beautiful to do, but it wasn't architectural, which is more pictures or graphic, whatever. But I did it and, and, uh, you know, I did it for a long time. And then when I got out, I was called down to do, uh, sing along Jubilee music hop. Um, they didn't, they couldn't, they called me down to Halifax. They said they couldn't use me for a little while. They were just getting it organized. So they said, come on down, get yourself together. I, I took a job with Canadian British engineering consultants as a draftsman for six months. While you were and, in Halifax? Uh, while I was in Halifax yeah. waiting to do the show. And then they called me and bam, away I went. Ironically, I, I was always coming in late in the mornings and the, in the, uh, the head engineers didn't say a thing to me because they read in the paper from Halifax that I was playing in all the clubs at night. And my name was always in the paper. So they, they, they knew what was going on. To me, there are no coincidences. And uh came in one day and uh, the head engineer called me into his office and said, Ken, I want to talk to you about something. He said, uh, they're, we're doing a, a whole town uh, planning change thing in, in, uh, in Anaganish. And he said that we need a liaison between our office and the mayor. And we would like to consider you as doing the job for us. You'd have to move there, blah, 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 blah. And I started to sweat blood standing there, knowing that this was really a crossroad for me. Because if I had taken the job, I would have made good money and I would have started a whole different adventure. And I said, I just looked him in the face and he could see me. He could see the sweat. Yeah. I said, I, I'm sorry. I thank you for this opportunity, blah, blah, blah. But uh, music is my life. I'm just waiting for da, da, da. And, and uh so shortly afterward, uh, I got the news that I got, they want, called me to the show and, and, uh, they had a little party for me, gave me some cufflinks with some music notes on them. And I started into, and then never looked back into a, what you call a straight job after that. That's neat. You know, and that's actually art when you're talking about like drawing uh, cogs and wheels, some of your paintings that you've done are, are pretty, are, are very precision like too. uh, the painting that you did recently, the nebula. There's a, there's a whole series of, of space art that I do. Your draftsman skills probably plays into that a little bit. Yes, you're right, it, especially just the perspective mostly but, and the precision. But when I was in one of the classes, I remember the, 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 uh, the teacher saying we were looking at a can. And a can, when you look at a can straight on, it's no longer round. It's actually a rectangle when you draw it. And uh, uh, so I was looking at it, and um, he was holding it up, and then he said, you know, it's hollow inside. And it has a certain thickness. So how are you going to? How do you represent that on a page? And he said, so if you're looking at it straight on, he says you have to look with your mind's eye, and that's the term he used. And he said, then you'll see that to draw that on paper, you have to put what they call hidden lines to show that there is a thickness to that that rectangle. But if you look at it from the top, it's round. If you look at it from the side, straight on, it's a rectangle. And I was saying in my mind as he was saying, oh, geez, I've been doing that all my life. I think with my mind's eye all the time. Mm. In other words, I have that ability to see. I always sort of believed that there was a, a space up in the, uh, in the uh, other dimension where there was a room where there was all kinds of paintings and there's a room with all kinds of songs that I'm supposed to bring down. And, uh, you know, for example, Dream Number 2. I mean, you know... That was that's that song was literally given to me, and on the larger sense of it, I know why it has it has touched a lot of people's lives. I give you there's a, there's so many stories behind Dream Number Two. However, when I first wrote it, I was in Montreal, and I remember having a beautiful girlfriend at the time, and we were both dressed in 
you know, uh, uh, bell bottoms and, you know, we're like outfits and we look cool and long hair and all this kind of stuff. And I remember we were about to go out and she said, excuse me, I got to use the loo. So she went off and, and I was sitting down with a pencil and a piece of paper there, a pad, and I was just drawing these wings. And when she came in, she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm drawing a picture of a pair of wings because I want to fly. Oh, my God, don't say a thing. Don't say one word. And I sat there and wrote two-thirds of the song. And it was just basically given to me. And uh, I knew that I had, that this was an important thing. Like I mentioned to you earlier, I, I said to my mother when I was a child that I had a destiny. And I've always believed that I'm, um, my dharma, as they say in the East, is to bring, in, bring beauty in through music and art. And that's what I strive to do. I think it's a good time to listen to dream number two, since we're talking about it, and we'll come back in a few minutes and continue the conversation. Thank you, Ken. This is great.
We'll be right back with more of the Atlantic Indie Roundabout with me, your host, Maurice O'Coin. Here we are in conversation with uh, Ken Tobias and uh, talking about uh, his music and his song crafting. And uh, let's go back to the earlier years again. I guess so when you, so you were fresh out of high school when you moved to Halifax? Yeah, I was lucky, you know. Um, I had been writing songs since I was about 14. And uh, I was into Bobby Blue Bland, The Miracles, The Crest, The Everly Brothers. I was into the radio. I'm a radio songwriter. I write hooks. And it just come to me because I was, I had a great teacher and that was radio. So uh, I think Greenfields or something, it was a folk tune that got to be number one on the charts. And then all of a sudden all these folk artists were coming in and folk music was happening. My brothers came to me and, and said, look, and I want to form this group called the Ramblers. Of course, he needed me because he wasn't really a singer so much as manager type. And uh, he could sing a little bit, and we made made up this group called the Ramblers. It wasn't that original, but we did all the folk music of the time. You know, it was Kingston Trio, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. We did really well with it, and we uh, started to travel. We became professional, and we traveled all the Maritimes. And uh, the Ramblers had played in a, a hoop nanny contest out of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. It was a big deal at the time. All the groups around there were in at the time, and. Uh, Patricia Ann McKinnon was there from, uh, she was on Sing Along. Our group won the contest, and uh, I had written a song called Little Drops of Water, Little Grains of Sand, which was uh, went over really well. Probably one of the, probably the second song I'd ever written, but it really, it had a hook and it worked. Anyway, uh, Patricia said, I uh, like what you're doing. Uh, we had our own CBC radio show out of Fredericton. I had some really good tapes. So she said, you got a tape? I said, yeah, I gave her a tape. I was still in high school, and um, she said, uh, I'll take it to Manny Pitson of Sing Along, and the guys who produced those shows, Music Hop and Sing Along. And she did, and, got, and they got in touch with me. And, of course, I graduated the summer of 65. My father said he had made a promise to me that if he said, if you straighten up and graduate, he said, I'll let you get out of the house at 20 years old. If you want, you can go and do whatever you want to do. And I remember watching the show. And uh, watching Music Hop, and I and I saw a guy singing on there, and he was flat. And I thought, geez, I could do that. And I remember using an expletive, the F word, and I said, ah, <laughs> I can do that. My father said, what? Don't say that stuff. No, you're not. I said, I'm going down or get on that show. No, you're not. I said, well, yeah, Dad, you know, you said, promised me I could go. He was <laughs> just holding back because he didn't want his son to leave home, you know. I got a note back from, uh, from Patricia that... Uh, that they were interested in me, and they said, well, then I got a letter from, come on down to Halifax and uh, get yourself uh, settled, get do so, whatever you have to do. We won't be able to use you for a while, but we want to use you. We like your tape, blah, blah, blah. That's how it went. Well, that's neat, because you got two, two, three seasons out of the show, I believe. Uh, I did, uh, <clears throat> I did, actually, there were four seasons, but what happened was one year, it was really great. I was in Montreal, and I used to go up there for the winter season and come back for summer because we shot the shows in the summertime. Right. And I, I'd go off for the winter season and I'd play, I played all the gigs through Montreal and, and uh, a place called Cafe Andre particularly. When we went to Halifax, uh, I, there was a group there called the Bad Seeds. I became part of that with Brian Hearn who went on to produce Anne and Anne Murray and Emmy Lou Harris and George Jones and God knows who else. Yeah. And uh, he was a big deal. And, but anyway, he was on the show and he liked my music he could see that I had some talent and he actually let me write. He was the music director, so he let me use my own songs on the show. Can you imagine I'm like yeah, 20 that's, years old. That's probably they're, they're quite let me a, sing my own songs. That's pretty cool. Fantastic, you know. Yeah. It's just I've seen a couple fantastic. of the old videos of you singing with Ann Murray. You guys really sang well together. We did. Uh, there was a good uh, camaraderie between us. Ann and I were a little bit different. Um, I just spoke to her recently it was because uh, was, there's somebody writing a book on me. And uh, they wanted to talk to her. So I had a t chance to chat with her. It was cool. But we, she didn't remember much. We, not that, uh, we don't remember much of what, what we did together. I got one, which is uh, Bethlehem, which we did. I remember that. That's the one the Christmas, from the Christmas show. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah, it, yeah, I saw that. That was lovely. Man, you guys sang so well together. And that's live off the floor. There's no, you, you can't fix that. That's the way no, it was that done. that was live off the floor. It was yeah, beautiful. We were, that's, that, that's what it was. And, and you know, um, Anne was Anne was kind of uh, at the time kind of straight, if I can use the term. And uh, we were I was like you know becoming uh, I was wearing you know beetle boots and and uh, growing my hair long, and we were all uh, sneaking pot in the backyard, you know, yeah. and, and and writing. We were getting we were more contemporary. I I was in rock and roll, and and so on. Even though see, we did sing along Jubilee because it was the show. It was a show. 
in oh, America yeah. times, you, you did everything. Bringing out our used-to-be rookies, now veterans of Sing Along Jubilee, Anne Murray and Ken Tobias. Here they are with Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem, yes he was, yes he was. Little baby born in Bethlehem, oh yes he was. Little baby born in Bethlehem, born right next to a sheep and a lamb. Oh, born in Bethlehem. He was a preaching in the temple. He was still a child. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. He was a preaching in the temple. He was still a child. Oh, yes, he was. He was a preaching in the temple. He was still a child. About peace and a mercy mild. Oh, 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 peace and mercy mild. He started in a walking across the land. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Was, um, was the more contemporary, and they were, that's why they were getting people like me on the show. And, you know, I have to say, you know, it was one of the best experiences of my life. I learned to be on television. I learned to be professional. At 20? And uh, at 20 years old, yeah. No. When you talk about destiny, this is all part of destiny. Uh, I had a group called The Book of Tobias, which was a songbook, and we played at the Black Knight Lounge, all these places around. And this guy came in one time who was from Montreal, come over to me and said, hey, I really like what you're doing. I want you to help me form a group in, Montre in Montreal. I got an idea for a group. Are you interested in coming up? And I said, yeah, because I, I, I needed broader horizons. Started playing at a place called Cafe Andre, and uh, there was a, uh, this is the connection with the bells. Um, Mike, uh, we, were playing the, we were playing the Cafe Andre and, as a trio, again, the book of Tobias, Charlie Clark who joined the Bells, and Mike Way, who joined the Bells, they're both from St. John. Uh, we were there, and uh, this guy said, let's form this group. We formed a group called The Crystal Staircase. Did a couple of recordings. Lisa Hart, who was a famous singer in Canada, uh, was also part of that for a while. And um, eventually, what happened was uh, I was playing the Cafe Andre, and we got a new a manager by the name of Kevin Hunter, who managed the Five Bells. <laughs> And they were basically a really well-dressed, uh, classy show band. And they played in, you know, Drake Hotel, New York, and all the various places. They, they kept coming in and seeing us play at the camp. They liked my trio, and they liked Mike and Charlie. So anyway, Kevin managed me as well. And uh, he said, one day he called me up and said, Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers is in town. He's playing down at the Copa. I called up his manager and they said, yeah, you can bring your kid down if you can be here in five minutes or ten minutes. They were, and it so happened, it was in the wintertime, but it was just down the end of my street where the, the where the um, Holiday Inn was, and that's where they were. He said, get your guitar, get your coat on, and get ready to run. So I did. He came to the house, and, and we just ran down the street to the hotel, went up the stairs, and knocked on the door. It was like ten minutes. Apparently, it was about half an hour since he talked to the guy. And a guy came to the door. His happened to be Michael Patterson, who was Bill Medley's, the Righteous Brothers keyboard player and uh, and um, guy who led the, the band. And uh, it turned out he became a friend of mine later on. But anyway, he was standing there with his beautiful suit jacket on and a Philly shirt and and, and a pair of boxer shorts and, <laughs> and, and, and socks up to his knees with those things that hold him up, garter things. <laughs> and he 
Well, see, when you show business, you don't put your pants on before you go out because you'll wrinkle them. So he was hadn't done that, and he came to the door and he said, "Oh, you're." He went, "Oh, you're here." <laughs> he didn't expect us to get there. So, um, come on in. So we went inside, and he sat down. And he said, "Okay, play me something." I played him a couple of songs, and he, he was like smiling. And then he went over to the phone, and he called up Bill Medley, who was in the other room. He said, uh, "Billy," he says, "Come on in," and uh, hear this guy. So. Bill came over and came in, and I, I have to tell you, that meeting this man was one of the best things in my life because he was a true, true gentleman, a true good heart, a good spirit, a good man, and not only very talented as well, but he was a great person. And uh, he, he, um, I can, I can speak his way because he, I, I got his voice down pretty. Much. Hi there, Kenny. How you doing? And uh, I said, good to meet you, Bill. <laughs> I love the Righteous Brothers. Blah blah. You never close. <laughs> and. Uh, so he said, I did that, and he said, oh, it sounds like me. And um, he said, uh, play me a song. So I played him. I think I played him during number two. Wow. And uh, then he said, play me something else. So I played him something else. And uh, he just said, how would, you, how would you and your manager like to be my guest tonight at the club? And I went, what? Oh, yeah. My heart was just singing. Even though I had been, been a professional already on television, this yeah. was bigger than that. You know, so anyway, we went to the club, and... Um, he was doing his, his show, and he was pretty amazing with his his uh, seven-piece group and blah, blah, blah. He stopped the show. He says, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you an up-and-coming rising star. <laughs> and he said, Ken Tobias. And, and uh, I went, what? Oh, and the light came on me, and I stood up. I said, wow, this man's treating me like... See, well, what I learned is in Hollywood, it's not who you are, it's who you're with. Mm. That's the story. And so I realized that's what he was doing. And I, I didn't realize till afterward. Anyway, so after the show was over, and this is really, I find this, because I'm a very metaphysical person, I'm a, I've been following a spiritual path for many years, and I'm into Eastern philosophy, and something happened, which was, I thought, very interesting. After the show was over, everybody was gone, and there was this one guy who was sweeping the floor, and I was sitting down in the middle, and Billy went up to the, to the, to the stage and took his tie off and sat down on the piano to cool out, and he was playing something. And this sweeper guy came over next to my my uh, my ear and said, "Who do you think you are? You're not going with this guy. He says he's a great star. You're nothing. What do you do? He's something." I went I, just out of nowhere. I said, "What?" I said, "Get away from me!" And it to me, it was always the dark forces trying to stop something good. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's that's the way I, I looked at it metaphysically, as opposed to just you know whatever. I, it, it, it was pretty amazing, was amazing to, to hear that happening. And just out of nowhere, this guy, and then he went on, and Billy says, get out of here. And the guy, he heard what he said, and the guy just kept on moving. Bill says, come on up here to the stage. I said, okay, man, I went up, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I like your songwriting. You're writing pretty good stuff. He said, I want you to, I'm writing this tune, because Bill wrote Lap, Little Lap, Loopy Lou, and all a bunch of stuff. He said, I want you to hear this tune. Tell me what you think. Well, in my mind, I said to myself, Ken, if you ever told the truth, it's t now's the time. If you don't like it, tell the truth. If you do like it, tell the truth. But don't lie to this guy. So he, I gave him my, my impression of the tune. He turned around on the stool and looked at me and says, uh, how'd you like to come to Hollywood? Oh, no, I'll never forget that moment. Changed my life. like you, never had a lover like you, make me feel so good, and I never had arms to hold me, I never heard the things you told me, and really understood before, what love is, whatever bit of love you give me, every bit of love you give me, makes me feel alright baby. Just something in me makes me feel alright, baby Oh, 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 oh,
listening to the Atlantic Indie Roundabout with me, your host, Maurice Coyne. Now, let's get back to the show.
How long did you live in L.A. for? Uh, off and on uh, four years. It would have been a very busy four years of your life. It was an interesting time. It was almost at times I lost uh, the world because living down there at that time period, and it was like California dreaming. Just a fantastic time. And all I had to do was write songs because they didn't have an H1 for me, so I couldn't perform. So all I had to do was write because I signed the contracts as a performer, but I signed as a, a writer as well. And so all I had to do was just write songs and they, they took care of everything else, and I would just hang out and write songs and hang out with friends and just live the California lifestyle, you know. Did you and, miss uh, performing? I did uh, for a while. I, I, it got bothered me, and I, I was always, uh, I always told the, uh, Charlie Clark and Mike Way that I'd be calling them down. And uh, I kept tell, going to the office and saying, hey, listen, how come my boys are not here? And finally, Michael Patterson hit me. He said, he said Ken, sit down. Listen, we're not going to be bringing them down. He said, we got... 7,000 musicians down here that are 10 times better than those guys. I said, oh, because you see, I kind of promised them that they would come. Meanwhile, I didn't realize that the Bells had already uh, acquired them in the group and uh, the Bells were going out and already uh, recording and doing stuff with Polydor Records. And um, how I found out was I got a call from BMI Canada and they said, did you know your song Stay A While was climbing the charts in American charts? And I went, no. You didn't even know that they had recorded the song? No. Wow. And uh, and uh, he said, yeah, it's climbing the charts. Uh, and uh, what is it this week? I said, oh, it's about 86, number 86. I went, holy cow. And then he said to me, so because BMI, you know, they are, they're your collection agency. They, they give you money. They collect your money, and they give, they'll they also give you advances <laughs> and stuff. And he said, would you, they asked me, would you like some money? Yeah. And I said, gee, yeah, well, yeah. Could I have a? Do you think I could have three hundred dollars? I have to buy a new guitar or something. <laughs> and they and they they gave me a huge, a large amount of money. They said, "No, you can have this amount." And I went, "What?" I was stunned by it, and I said, "Oh my God!" And then it hit me, Ken, you've arrived. You're now a professional songwriter with a hit record. And that song and, actually uh, did go number one, number one in Canada. Number one, Canada. Number seven in Billboard. Fantastic. <laughs> Here's the thing that was funny. Put your hand in the hand was climbing the charts as well. And we were going neck and neck up the charts, and they made it to number one. I got to number seven. But you know who wrote Put Your Hand in the Hand was Gene McClellan from Sing Along yeah. Jubilee. Wow. Now you tell me that there's no coincidence that there aren't. I mean, there was two maritime guys from the same show, songs that they wrote climbing the charts. That was just phenomenal. That's a good story. You know? Good time to listen to uh, Stay A While, because I'd like to hear your version. Into my room she creeps Without making a sound And into my dream she peeps We have her hair all long and hanging down How she makes me quiver how she makes me smile With all the love I have to give her I guess I'm gonna stay with her a while Sheds the curls from my eyes She drops her robe on the floor She reaches for the light on the bureau And the darkness is a pillow once more How she made me quiver She makes me smile With all the love I have to give her I guess I'm going to stay with her
just heard Stay a While by Ken Tobias, the writer of the song. Of course, the song did go number one in Canada, number seven in the States, I believe you said. That's right. How many other songs have you written for other people that, that garnered success? Well, I don't I don't know. I don't think they, I had that many. I mean, there was people like Floyd Kramer. Was the, he's the great yeah. country pianist who was, an, he's like a Chet Atkins. Everybody knew him for his piano playing and covered Stay a While. I was so great, glad to see Hank Snow doing Stay a While. He did it with someone. I had uh, Anne Murray do one of my songs. Didn't on Susan Jacks do one of yours as well? Susan Jacks did Dream Number Two, and she called it Dream. She asked me if I she could change it because she wanted to call the album Dream. You know, she was a, a true heroine. She, uh, you know, she she was like I don't know four or five times. Uh, uh, you know, she lost a kidney, and then her brother gave her a kidney, and then she was <laughs> now in search for another one. Yeah. And she just she really suffered a lot, and she went through and kept coming back, boy. Uh, I kept in touch with her on Facebook and and all the people who she, her fans, she loved them and de dealt with them and always gave them love and friend and, and never held back anything. She wasn't uh, phony or... You know, so, I mean, all the time you spent in L.A. and learning the bigger picture, I guess, the inside of the business and all that, you've recorded eight albums? I've actually done 10 albums. There's like plenty of singles, like dozens of singles have, have come up over the years. I mean, I think 22 or 23 singles. Fantastic. Or I'm familiar, very familiar with about, you know, four or five of them anyway. And uh, those are the songs that I grew up on, you know, um, the KTEL records and all that stuff. And Sure, yeah, know, the big I'm hits. proud of those ones. And, well, you should be, because those, like you said, it's a hook. It's, you know how to write a hit song. If you look at one of those uh, KTEL records, you'll see a Ken Tobias next to a Stevie Wonder, you know, and I think, That's, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. And I put you in <laughs> good, you put, you in, put you in excellent company. Um, <laughs> so um, I've been on your Facebook page for, you know, for quite a while now, and I've been noticing, when, when, you know, talking about your painting and all that. But very recently, you recorded another song you were putting together, and you put it out there for us to kind of like critique, I guess. You put it for us to kind of hear with your pedigree. It was a very humble way to introduce new music to your fans. Well, you see, I I've st I've still write and record almost every day. And uh, I have my own recording studio. I mean, I don't do it for anybody else. I do it for me. I've got a whole bunch of songs recorded, mastered, and in the can. Really? And, I, and my and my manager and publisher, he just says every once in a while, we 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 just put we release one to Spotify or somebody like that, and we just put it out there. And sometimes I'll put it up on my Facebook and say, here's a new song, folks. Hope you like it. You know, you know check it out, something. Yeah, but you see, as a song, you know, you're a songwriter. You know that even if you didn't have a job signed to a company or if you weren't, weren't trying to get hits, you, that's what you do. You're a songwriter. And, you know, one of the things about not being with a record company, and my brother has one, but uh, uh, when we release something, we put it through him. But, uh, but not having a record company, I have nobody telling me how to write my songs and nobody telling me what direction to go in because, like, you know, as, as good as Attic Records were, I love those guys. They were good to me. Uh, Al Mayer, who's a fantastic human being, he's just getting the order in Canada. And those guys, when I did my Every Bit of Love album, we had four hits off, four Canadian hits off that record. But I had a piece on there called Save the Forest, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people came to see me play live, because it was a, I've always had really dynamite bands, really uh, high quality bands. And we did everything from fusion to, to rock to blues, whatever we did. Uh, but we did my hit, my, my hits. And, um, so this song was called Save the Forest. And uh, it was like, I don't know, eight minutes long. It's on the Every Bit of Love album. And they asked me, why did you, why did you put this eight minute song on here? And I said, listen, I'm a, I'm an artist. I believe in stuff. Yeah. It's called Save the Forest. That's why I wrote it for the, for the album. It's, this album is not just writing hit songs. I didn't even write those songs to be hits. I just wrote them. And um, I just happened to be able to write a hook. And uh, so you release four of the tunes. And so what I'm trying to say is that I, nobody tells me what to write. And it's because 
Same as my paintings. My, my paintings are diversified. I don't just write one theme. I paint anything that I want to paint. So so one day I paint a, a portrait. Some paint a, I might paint my dog. Next thing you know, I paint some space painting. You're exactly right. Uh, your music is quite diverse. One song, like I, mean, I find, uh, like Dream Number 2, I, I hear shades of Neil Diamond in there, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But you do a song like Oh Linda, and that's quirky, and it's a totally different kind of song. Can I ask you, what is that instrument? Oh, that's a that the that, 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 that yeah. That's a that's a moog. Uh, not a moog. Sorry, it was a, uh, an arp. It was an arp odyssey. I couldn't tell if it was a wind instrument or if it was a it was, if it was electronic or what it was. That was a neat little riff. You know, but but that's the that point. Song the songs are so different. You know, that song was going to be successful, and uh, then all of a sudden they banned it on the radio because I said, "Oh Jesus, help!" And it, it was an uh, it was a total. Uh, legitimate thing to say at the moment. I wasn't cursing or anything. No. It was a legitimate thing to say. Stay a while was banned for a while too. They wouldn't play that because but, how she makes me quiver. Yeah. That, you know, it's just intimacy. That's all it is. It's not. That's what happens with people. But you know, there are some people who, and and it was in those days. Now nowadays, they just laugh at it. I liked Olinda a lot. I thought it was a clever tune. I know? thought it was very clever. That's why I brought it up. I want to know what that instrument was. That's fabulous. I'd like to play that. We'll be right back with more of the Atlantic Indie Roundabout with me, your host, Maurice O'Coin.
am I watching lonely people passing by the way how are things in New York City anyway Time moves slow When you're sitting waiting for someone You know To call and say they're thinking of you like Okay And how are things in New York City music and you're putting music together in the studio uh do you give uh, the musicians the freedom to flourish on your songs a little bit and, or do you pretty much have well, it all laid out for them now i do everything myself i i actually when i record i record sort of like like i am a band and i i, I even say things sometimes in one of my songs play boys or something like that <laughs> and, uh, and 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 it gives me that camaraderie like i think i'm feeling in my head because i had my studio i would go in and i'd record demos myself I know that I have responsibilities to the record company to come up with the hits. And there's that line where you have to try to, to, to keep together where you are being inspired and doing what you want to do at the same time, try to give the, uh, the, the success to the record company as well because they're putting the money out. So I would, um, I would make demos myself, and uh, the demos would have certain hooks in them, and I'd take them to the musicians, and I'd say, here. And I'd give them all a copy, and I'd say, learn the songs the way they are first. Just learn them exactly like that. So when we come to rehearsal, you're going to play this. And then if you come up with an idea that you want, that you want to tell me about it, tell me, hey, Ken, I, I think the bass line could do this. Very kind of hooky. Okay, I dig it, do it, etc. They would have freedom to do that. Now, I have to give a lot of credit to my bands because I've had like 20 bands. And if you get the right guys, you give them the tune because they knew I was a good musician, even though I couldn't play the part. I can play it with my mouth. I know what it is. And I would, I would explain to them, for example, unless we were playing something like, um, a song we, on one of my albums called Downtown. It's an uptown. It has a jazz. It has a, uh, a rock jazz feel to it. It's going to do, do, And I said, okay, here I want, I want the, the band to go, ba da ba da 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 da. I want them to do that right here. They understand exactly what I mean. It's like a horn shot, but the whole band's playing it. So, they get it. They understand. They just do it. There's music in the city. They're dancing in the streets. The ladies are looking. 
looking so pretty The boys are stamping their feet And if you go downtown, downtown I have a new ball hog, yeah And if you go downtown, downtown I have a new ball hog, yeah. And if you go downtown, downtown You should have bought it all that long, yeah The rumble of the traffic is everywhere Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Atlantic Indie Roundabout. And it was such a special episode that we had to break it into two episodes. And yes, we'll be bringing you the second half of this fascinating conversation with Ken Tobias. We'll see you next week at the same time, same place. And from our village to yours, take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>